64 in your hymnals. Just a few more days to be filled with praise and to tell the old, old story. Then when twilight falls and my Savior calls, I shall go to him in glory. I'll exchange my cross for a starry crown where the gates swing outward never. At his feet I'll lay every burden down and with Jesus reign forever. Just a few more years with their toil and tears and the journey will be ended. When I'll be with him where the tide of time with eternity is blended. I'll exchange my cross for a starry crown where the gates swing outward never. At his feet I'll lay every burden down and with Jesus reign forever. What a joy it will be when I wake to see him for whom my journey is burning. Never more to sigh, never more to die, for that day my heart is yearning. I'll exchange my cross for a starry crown, where the gates swing outward never. At his feet I'll lay every burden down, and with Jesus reign forever. All right. Uh, if you open up your bulletins, uh, take a look at those together. Mission of the month is tonight. It's Pennsylvania Family Camp. I'll be bringing a uh, presentation uh, on that. Um, breaking the Fast is this Thursday, uh, November 1st, starting at 6 p.m. Men's meeting is next Lord's Day, November 4th, starting at 9 a.m. Uh, the Lima Fall Fest is November 3rd, starting at 4 p.m. That's at the building there on Cole Street. And the PA Ladies Advanced dates are in there. Also, <clears throat> remember, uh, next week is our fall back. So uh, you might want to <laughs> keep that in mind, too or else uh, you're getting here uh, early, which is better than the opposite. Um, but <clears throat> those, are, those are our announcements. Any other announcements that we should be aware of here? OK, um, I will have the Siberian solstice dates in there next week. Um, there's some flyers out. Those are available to give away to people uh, right there on kind of the uh, the pulpit welcome center. Uh, four flyers here too. Okay, so if you get take as many as you want, we got more flyers. Looks like he's got some color flyers, some black and white flyers. So um, go ahead and and take some of those. Mission of the month, as I mentioned, was PA Family Camp. Go ahead and bring some snacks. We'll uh, enjoy a fellowship time after assembly this evening. Uh, thankful for the Bible studies, Sunday school teachers, the lock-in. Um, <coughs> The Good Report on Dick's Health, uh, Joe Shanahan's Safe Travel, uh, The Heat. Um, thankful for the Good Report on Kenneth Wilson, uh, Harbor Travel, Donaldson Travel. Thankful for the Ladies Spa. Uh, a lot of our ladies are uh, there in Lancaster here this morning. So uh, continue to keep that in your prayers. Really grateful and thankful for uh, the Ladies Spa and thankful for the Good Report on uh, Abby. Um, that's Judy Stein, Judy Stein's granddaughter. What other Thanksgivings do we have? I'll save you a sheet. Okay. Okay, so Bonnie Eberly is possibly going home on Monday, so things are progressing positively there. else? Any other thank yous? Okay, continue to keep Natalie as she recovers uh, from her surgery in your prayers. Trace and Schuler, Keegan, that's Aurora's friend. Uh, Dennis, sounds like physical therapy is in store for you. Yeah, 
Okay. Okay. So continue to keep Dennis as he uh, not only has physical therapy, but also has to continue to deal <coughs> with the problem uh, in your prayers. Um, Tom, uh, still waiting on results there, right? Yeah, we know my uh, TikTok likes to stop every once in a while. Okay. Right. <laughs> Keep that in your prayers. Anna Lopez, that is um, Millie's uh, daughter. Keep her in your prayers. The Ike and Ella Fund. Um, did you go to that yesterday, Bill? Good report there. Thanks. <laughs> I think they raised like $16,000. Oh, great. And 100% of that goes to Because they've had a lot of families here recently, right? Yeah. So to you to keep them in your prayers. Um, Datha just told me uh, this morning that uh, Mary Lee passed away last night, 3.30 this morning. So keep the Greitman family uh, in your prayers. We were praying for uh, Mary Lee and Dolores, and Mary Lee passed away at 3.30 this morning. So keep um, the Greitman family in your prayers. Dolores called me last night. She's doing pretty good. Okay. So, good report on Dolores. Continue to keep her in your prayers. What additions do we have? Ben. What else we got? Okay. All right. If not, uh, let's go ahead and go to song number 650. 650. And then I'll have a prayer. And then after I pray, uh, Tom has our Sunday school this morning. 650. <clears throat> We'll sing uh, all four verses of this, and then I'll have a prayer, and then Tom will come uh, for our Sunday school lesson. There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless wave. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light, send the light. And a golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light, send the light. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore let us pray that grace may everywhere abound send the light send the light and a christ-like spirit everywhere be found send the light send the light send the light the blessed gospel light let it shine from shore to shore send the light the blessed gospel light let it shine forevermore let us not go weary in the work of love send the light send the light let us gather jewels for a crown above send the light send the light send the light the blessed gospel light let it shine from shore to shore send the light the blessed gospel light let it shine and forevermore. Let's pray. Great God, I'm so grateful and thankful for the family of Christ. I'm thankful for your body. 
Lord, I'm thankful for the mission uh, that you have given to us, Lord God, to send that light. Father, I'm grateful and thankful for uh, everybody who's made an effort to be out here uh, for first hour, Lord God. I just pray that you would uh, bless the study time, Lord. I just uh, pray that you would be with the Greitman family in particular this morning. I pray that uh, you would bring uh, your will there and your comfort there. Father, I just uh, pray that you would um, be with all those who are traveling. Father, a number of our uh, group are traveling to Lancaster. and uh, Brenna and Mary Jo are out of town. I pray that you would give them safety, Father. I just pray that uh, you would continue to uh, be with um, each, uh, excuse me, I pray that you would uh, give uh, all of them safety on the road, Lord, and I just uh, am grateful and thankful for the many opportunities that we have. I'm thankful for the camps and the rallies that exist. pray that you would bless the upcoming uh, Lima Fall Fest, Lord God, and I'm just thankful for the opportunities that we have to be able to fellowship with the congregations that are close to this area. I'm really grateful and thankful that Lima is so close and that Bellevue is so close and that even Lancaster is not a real far drive, and I'm just thankful for the network of churches that we have, Lord God, to be able to encourage uh, one another to, uh, to help one another uh, on to send that light. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Tom. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all today. Good to be seen. In uh, all my years in the church, and in all my opportunities to uh, bring a lesson, I have never had to bring a lesson on a Thursday night and then do one on the following Sunday morning. So this is kind of new for me. So. My assigned text for this morning is out of John chapter 17. If you'd like to turn there, please. And the verses we're going to be looking at this morning are 13 through 21. So let's go ahead and let's read through those. But now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy made full in themselves. And I have given them, and I should probably explain that the them that it's talking about here is the apostles. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask thee to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. As thou didst send me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves may also be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you did send me. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty Father, we are so appreciative of the words that are written in your holy script. Father, what a great thing it is to have the completed word of God, to be able to reference to it in times of trouble, but also, Father, to be able to reference to it in times of joy and love and peace and grace and compassion, all the great things that you give us. But Father, we know that your word is true and we know, Father, that things that it speaks about took place and that, Father, these things were done for our edification and for our, for our opportunity to be your sons, whether male or female, Greek nor Jew, slave nor free man, Father, those that are in Christ are your sons, and we thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So the interesting thing that I found out as I've been studying through Luke chapter 17 is this whole section, this whole chapter is a prayer. And it's a prayer that Jesus did specifically for the apostles. Now, on Thursday night, we kind of talked about who the apostles were. So I'm not going to go and repeat any of that. But this is the prayer that Jesus is doing in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night before he was taken into custody by the temple guards and taken to Caiaphas and Pilate and gone through the whole thing that's going to lead up to his crucifixion. Now is the time. It's coming down to that point. Jesus' work basically is done. This is it. This is the hour. So what I did is I took a look at some of the other gospel accounts of the prayer. And as we go through this, you'll see what I'm going to say. Uh, let's turn to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, and we're going to start in verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. And he said to them, My soul is is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face, praying, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as thou wills. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, thy will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were, were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. So it's interesting here in Matthew, it's talking about the prayer that Jesus did. And it talks about basically three times in praying the same thing. Father, if it's your will, take this cup from me. But if not, your will be done. Now, I took a look in Mark. And we're not going to turn there. Mark chapter 14, verses 32 through 42. And it basically it says pretty much exactly the same thing that it says here in Matthew. And that's what, it, that, like I say, Mark is just kind of a repetition of, of Matthew. But uh, let's go to Luke chapter 22. Luke 22. And we're going to look at verses 39 through 46. And he came out and proceeded, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, Let's see, am I in the right place here? Okay, uh, this is correct. And he came out and proceeded, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples also followed him. And when he arrived at the place, he said unto them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if thou art willing, remove this cup from me, Yet not my will, but thy will be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. And then he arose from prayer. He came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Arise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. So there's a little bit of a difference here in Luke. It actually talks about an angel actually coming to Jesus and ministering to him. 
And then it also talks about how hard and how intent Jesus is praying because his sweat became like drops of blood. The only gospel account that talks about Jesus praying for the apostles is this John chapter 17. And it actually, you know, it gives us a whole chapter concerning this prayer. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, in his prayer in John chapter 17, Jesus focuses on his disciples. His focus is that they retain the knowledge that he had imparted to them, that the Father protect them from the evil one, and also that that knowledge and that protection would actually would extend then to the people that the apostles had taught. Now, I think a very strong case can be made that that protection and that, that shield that Jesus is praying about here doesn't just extend to the ones that the apostles physically talk to, but also that it extends to those of us today who, through the word that has been written, also have. The apostles have spoken to us through the scriptures. You know, as it's been said by others, the red letter uh, words are the words that Jesus spoke while he was on earth, and the whole rest of the thing are the words that Jesus spoke while he was in heaven. But that speaking came through the writings of the apostles. So we have that same protection, that same shield that God gave to the apostles from Jesus' prayer. And something else that I think that's interesting that we all need to understand is, in a way, Jesus is praying to God as an intercessor for the apostles and for us. This is exactly what Jesus does for us in heaven. When we pray to God in Jesus' name, Jesus is interceding for us, just like Jesus is interceding here in John chapter 17. I think that's really important for us to understand. We have an intercessor. We have a high priest, so to speak, that speaks for us. Now, I read a little bit out of a, uh, an article that was written, I think, by Jay Wilson. And, Datha, there's your copy you had requested. And, uh, Mike, here's a couple copies that you had requested. But I want to read a little something. It's towards the end. This is a, uh, an article. No author, but again, I think it was Jay. It's called The Consummation of the Ages. And this is the last little section that, that was written. The Christian then should be greatly motivated to pray through the name of Christ, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him, that's a quote out of Ephesians chapter 3. No one, simply no one, from the days of the old covenant before Christ appeared in the true holy place could pray as the Christian can pray and be heard. No one, simply no one, from the pages of Genesis through the gospel, according to John, could come into the presence of God as a spiritual being and fellowship with the Almighty in the most intimate of all communions, all as a result of the consummation of the ages. Preach and pray. So what this author is saying, basically, is we have direct access to God through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, we should pray. And we should understand and know that our prayers are always heard. 
for the Christian, for that, for the one who is in Christ, our prayers are heard by God. And we have an advocate before the Father who's got all the power and the authority and the love and the grace and the compassion to make things happen. No matter what the answer was when we pray, it is heard. So I want to go back to John chapter 17, verse 21. And look at the verse here where it says, That they may be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, and that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you did send me. Now, I believe what Jesus is praying about here is looking forward. Looking forward to the Spirit. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Second Corinthians chapter 3, I want to start in verse 17, and we're going to read a little bit into chapter 4. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or uh, adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservant for Jesus' sake. For God said, Light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. I believe that what it's talking about back in John chapter 17, when it's talking about how God is in Jesus, Jesus is in God, and that the apostles are in God and in Jesus, that it is specifically talking about the Spirit. The spirit that was to be given through immersion into Christ. Just like it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, will she the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. That is what it's speaking about. It's speaking forward. Now, in verse 14 of John, chapter 17, it talks about, I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. The word here is really an important thing. It talks about it also earlier in this chapter. The word that has been given. So, this scripture that we have, this Old and New Testament that is ours, What is it exactly? Let's go to Psalms chapter 19. Psalms chapter 19. We're going to look at verses 7 and 8. The law of the Lord, which is referencing the word, is perfect. Restoring the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. It's pure 
and it's perfect. Let's go to Psalms chapter 119. Psalms chapter 119. Start with verse 151. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. And now let's skip up to one, uh, verse 160. The sum of thy word is truth, and every one of thy righteous ordinances is everlasting. It's pure, it's perfect, it's truth. Now, the New Testament speaks also in accordance with these same things. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 5. And verse 26. Let's start in verse 25. This is good for us husbands to have here. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. How, is, how are the people of the church been cleansed? They've been cleansed in their immersion, and they have been also cleansed with the word. And let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 12, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and the spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So this word is pure, perfect, it's truth, it sanctifies and it also is living and active. So we have a responsibility as members of the body of Christ. And that responsibility is in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Be diligent, in verse 15, be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as workmen who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. So we have a responsibility. We need to be able to handle accurately this word. Now, that does not happen by a simple process of being immersed and all of a sudden we have all this knowledge that comes over us. We have to, just as one with a, a rifle or a pistol would go to the range to practice, to be able to make sure that they're accurate in how they're shooting, we have to practice the word. We have to read it, we have to study it, we have to understand it, and that will make us be good workman for God who can diligently present this pure, perfect truth that God has given us. Now, I want to go back to John, verse, uh, verses 14 and 16 here. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask thee to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. So I have a question that I want to put before the congregation this morning. And I'm looking for some input here. What does it mean 
when it talks about the apostles here and also those that would believe the words that the apostles would be teaching, what does it mean about them not being of the world? And I'm going to wait till somebody raises their hand and says. Marshall? It's a reference back to John chapter 3, where Jesus is talking about how he is from heaven. Okay. He says, I'm from above. It means John chapter 3, verse 3 and 5. Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. That's literally from above. Uh, truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom. God, Jesus talks about how he's not born of a woman in Matthew 11, 11, you know, uh, John the Baptist is born of woman, and he is born from above, and so when uh, he says, I'm not of the world, they're not of the world, making the point that they are from above. Okay, good. Ben, did you have your hands raised? Bill, was it you? Oh, I was. Mike. And by extension, that goes to the, to the body of Christ. I mean, sometimes we are pretty flippant about set your mind on things. Well, but that doesn't mean to think occasionally. It means to, to realize we are not of this world. We're not of the flesh. We're of the spirit. If we're not spirit, we don't belong. So it's more than a mindset. But it is an understanding of one's life that you're not just in church on the first day of the week or maybe Thursday night or uh, Lord's Day evening, but you are not of this world 24-7. How easy of a thing is it to have that attitude. Again, is it just you make that statement and then you go on with your life? Or do you actually make this be part of who you are? Understand that Jesus has made you more than just a human being. Now, not having done that so that we can be arrogant and we can lord it over others. That's, you know. But there is a place in the scriptures where it does talk about, you know, for those that are God's. By that I mean that they are God's possession. They are God's people. That they are more than human. They are God's. Now, I don't want to give anybody the idea or the impression that we're talking here about how there's any kind of equality with Jesus or God. That's totally ridiculous. But he has made us more than we were before. We have actually the indwelling presence of Christ himself in us. And as it talked back there in... Uh, uh, was it? Second Corinthians. As it talked in Second Corinthians, let's go back there. Second Corinthians <coughs> chapter three. For God has said, light shall shine, this is verse 6, For God has said, light shall shine, shine out of the darkness in the one who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. You know, Jay Wilson has talked about how, you know, if someone has spiritual eyes and they were to cut a Christian open, they should be able to see the light shining forth from that Christian. Now, 
I'm not going to get a scalpel out and open anybody up to test that today. So breathe easy. But let's start looking at each other in the church as who we really are. We're not just fellow workers like compatriots like we have at the job site. We're not just family like with our cousins and our nephews and our nieces. We are to be one in Christ. God is in Christ. Christ is in God. Christ is in us. We each are so unique and wonderful and beautiful that we need to start understanding just exactly who we are as the church. This isn't just a place we come to have some fellowship with some compatriots. It's not even this is a place that we come to have fellowship with our fellow soldiers. This is a place that we come to share Jesus with, with each other. And he's with us here. So, that's what I have for you all this morning. Understand who we are, not just individually, but understand who we are as a body of believers. This is vital for the forward progress of the church. So that we can really get excited and really show to those who are out in the world, the lost, just exactly what the church is all about. Let's go to God in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your church. Thank you, Father, for the blood of Christ that has sanctified the church. Thank you, Father, for the word that has also cleansed and sanctified the church. Help us to understand who you've made us to be. Help us to be your mighty army. But help us to realize that we are immortals that cannot be destroyed. Just like Jesus was saying to his, to his apostles that they needed to not take a cloak and they needed to not worry about what was going to happen. Just stay steadfast, keep marching forward because no one can do anything to us as long as we're doing what's right. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Two minutes, guys, two minutes.
Morning, everybody. Morning. Today's reading is out of John 6, 1 through 21. <clears throat> Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up, to the mount, up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked us only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered, eight months wages would not, be, would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. <clears throat> Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? <clears throat> Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they had gotten into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had yet not joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed three or three, Three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Thanks, Logan. Good morning, Saints. Good morning. <clears throat> Good to be uh, gathered together on this uh, Lord's Day morning. Our first song this morning is song number 648, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, 648. And I would ask that if you're able, that you would be standing. 648, and we will sing all four of these, verse, all four of these verses as we stand. 648. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, for Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. For to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Ye that are men now serve him against unnumbered foes. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, and watching unto prayer, where duty calls or danger, be never wanting there. 
Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor's song. To him that overcometh a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. You can be seated. <clears throat> song number 405, 405 will be our prayer song. <clears throat> 405, if Jesus goes with me, if you want to take out your bulletins, we'll go over our prayer requests together. The announcements are listed there. You can read those uh, for yourself. Uh, one thing that I will do here is I will send around the breaking of the fast list, <clears throat> so that can be going around. Also, tonight is the uh, mission of the month. I encourage you to bring snacks uh, for afterwards. We'll have a little fellowship time. And one thing that's not listed there is Siberian Solstice. There are um, flyers for Siberian Solstice um, on uh, the Welcome Center there, the pulpit there. And uh, there are more flyers available as well. Uh, so don't be shy about handing uh, those uh, out. Um, <clears throat> Really grateful and thankful for the Bible studies that are going on. Um, thankful for uh, the Sunday school teachers. Thankful for the, the lock-in. Thankful for Dick's successful uh, health report. Um, Joe Shanahan's uh, travel. Um, the heat. Grateful and thankful that the uh, boiler came on. And uh, grateful that we have a, a warm, nice building to come to. Thankful for the safe uh, harbor travel and Donaldson travel. Um, thankful for the ladies' spa. That's where a number of our ladies are uh, this morning. Uh, so keep that in your prayers as they travel back. Uh, thankful and grateful for uh, things like uh, the ladies' spa that exist. Judy Stein's granddaughter, Abby, uh, she's uh, doing better, so that's a thank you. Um, Bonnie Eberly is improving. Um, Dolores uh, Greitman is also improving. Really great to see uh, Steve and Carol here with us uh, this morning. Grateful and thankful to see them. And uh, also grateful that he wanted me to pass on, uh, that he was really grateful and thankful for everybody who helped out and provided meals. And so uh, just super great to see him back on the road uh, to recovery. He said it's a <laughs> post-surgery pain is a completely different kind of pain. So thankful for thankful for that and uh, thankful that he's doing better um, as far as requests go uh, continue to keep Natalie as she recovers from her surgery in your prayers Tristan Schuler Keegan that's Aurora's friend uh, Dennis gave us a bit of an update um, they are not able to kind of fix the problems with his rotator cuffs so he's not going to have to have surgery um, but also <clears throat> not not the solution we were exactly looking for. So hopefully physical therapy goes well uh, there. Continue to keep Tom and his heart in your prayers. Uh, keep uh, Anna Marie Lopez in your prayers. That's Millie's daughter. Um, keep her health situation uh, in your prayers. The Ike and Ella Fund, they've had a number of families that have lost um, children. It's a fund that reaches out to uh, to families that have lost uh, little babies. And so keep them uh, in your prayers. They had a successful fundraiser this past Saturday, but continue to keep the Ike and Ella Fund in your prayers. Keep the Greitman family in your prayers. Mary Lee passed away uh, this morning at 3.30 uh, a.m. Uh, that's uh, Datha's uh, sister-in-law. So keep um, the Greitman family uh, in your prayers. And also keep uh, Dean Galbraith in your prayers. Dean is going to be traveling this week, uh, so he's going to need to fly. So keep his travels uh, in your prayers. If you have something else, go ahead and fill out one of these sheets uh, and get those to me, and we'll get those uh, announced this evening so that the saints can be uh, praying for everything. 
We'll sing song number 405, 405, and then Mike Nagy will come uh, and have a prayer for us. Song number 405. It may be in the valley where countless dangers hide. It may be in the sunshine that I in peace abide. But this one thing I know, if it be dark or fair, if Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Tis heaven to me where I may be if he is there. I count it a privilege here, his cross to bear. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. It may be I do bury the blessed word of life across the burning deserts to those in sinful strife. And though it may my lot to bear my colors there, if Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. Tis heaven to me, where I may be, if he is there. I count it a prayer. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we do thank you for the many blessings that we have, the, the friends and the family that we have to share with, those that uh, we can be concerned about. Uh, you know the, the needs of the heart. You know the needs of, of each and every one of us. We do pray for wisdom and guidance to say and do the things that are necessary to help those around us. Um, we think about the souls that are lost, those that uh, are striving to come to know you in this world that's uh, drifting away from you every day. We do pray that uh, each, each one of us would carry your words with us, act as a, in a way that pleases you, and show this world the meaning of Christ and life and holiness. We pray for those who are suffering at this time. We, we know the ailments of the body can distract us from doing your work and your will. We do pray that uh, as we struggle in this life, we are not uh, distracted, but uh, overcome, that uh, you grant us healings as we need, and be with us in everything. We are, again, thankful to enjoy the many blessings that we have as a family here, and we ask that you be with us in our thoughts, our actions, and in the hearings of these words, that we can bring you honor and glory in everything. We pray, amen. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's do song number 467. 467, we have an anchor. 467, we have an anchor. And then Tom will come and have our uh, Lord's Supper meditation. And Adam will come uh, and have our stewardship. 467, we have an anchor. <clears throat> 
Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold their wings of strife, when the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. It is safely more till the storm withstand. For it is well secured by the Savior's hand. And the cables pass from his heart to mine, can defy the blast through strength divine. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. When our eyes behold through the gathering night, the city of gold, our harbor bright. We shall anchor fast by the heavenly shore with the storms all past forevermore. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grab Good morning, saints. It's good to be in the body of Christ, right? Amen. We're going to take a look at uh, some scriptures out of Luke 22 this morning as we contemplate the Lord's Supper, what it means to us. Go ahead and read it, Luke 22, 14, 14 through 20. And when the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this, is this and share it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread, he gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this of remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, and after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus says here that he earnestly, earnestly desired to eat this Passover meal. And it goes on to say that he's not going to be partaking again until the kingdom of God comes. Now, there's a lot of confusion out there in the world about the kingdom of God. A lot of the denominational churches believe that the kingdom of God is coming. But brothers and sisters, I tell you that the kingdom of God is here. You know, I read some scriptures earlier this morning out of, uh, out of John, chapter 17. It talked about how God was in Jesus, Jesus was in God, and Jesus is in us. Amen? Amen. Jesus is here today with us through his Holy Spirit, which indwells those who are in Christ. 
How exciting is it that we can share in the kingdom of God? Yes, there is a day coming after he's finished preparing the place for us that we will be in heaven. But the church is a heavenly place. As it says in another scripture, he has raised us up and seated us with him in the heavenly places. And brothers and sisters, the church of Jesus Christ is a heavenly place. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, just to, to understand the life that was given, Father, you shed your blood for this. We can each look around and know that we are in the kingdom. This is what your son so, was will, so willingly gave himself for, that we can be seated with you in the heavenly places. I'm just so grateful and thankful for the example he left behind. I'm thankful for the understanding of what it took for us to have this relationship with you. Father, that we have been sanctified and set apart for your use. Help us to never uh, take for granted what it took to fill the cup and the loaf as we partake in this meal. Father, I'm just so grateful and thankful for all that you do and continue to do through your son, Christ Jesus. Probably say in Jesus' name, amen.
morning. Good morning. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Scriptures call us saints, children of God. We're also called ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador comes to show or tell people the official position of the person that sent him. Now I'm starting to think about that a little bit. I mean, the United States has lots of uh, ambassadors that go throughout the world and represent our official position. And if you think about, they have to be given respect because they know the power that the United States holds. But when you're an ambassador for Christ, a lot of the world has a skewed idea of what Christ is. They don't have a whole lot of respect for his position. So first, they need to be able to see Christ lived out. They need to see it in you and in me. And when they start to see that, then they'll want to talk about Christ. Then they'll want to sit down and have Bible studies and talk about his position on the scriptures. They'll be able to show them the truth. But first, your actions have to back that up. You have to show them that. I remember uh, my first job was in the, uh, in the restaurant business, and Sunday was always the busiest day. And a lot of times, if you ever ask a waitress about working on Sundays, a lot of waitresses don't want to work on Sundays because Christians that come in are rude, very short, and they're not real good tippers. Now, think about that. That's, that's their position on Christians. They call themselves Christians. They hang this title on themselves, and they, they do their hour or two during the week on Sunday, then the rest of the day they just go about their, their business. But if I hang that title on myself, you better show me by the fruits that you are a Christian. I came across this on the Internet the other day, and I, I really like it. It's called The Man in the Arena. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly with airs, who becomes short again, who comes short again and again, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who is at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement. And who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring, daring uh, greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. I submit to you, the ideas world of a Christian is the one standing in the audience critiquing the person that's in the arena. People think about Christians as the one taking the Bible and showing them how they're wrong. How about you, Christian? How about you be in the arena and you show them how it's done so they can come to you and ask questions? Matthew chapter 7. Uh, starting in verse 16. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles are they. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Let's pray. Gracious Father, Almighty King, help us, Father, to just, just exactly understand the picture that has been laid out before us as to who we are and what you have asked us to do. It's really not a lot, Father. You just asked us to be dutiful, gracious, and loving sons. And this, Father, we can do through the spirit that indwells us. Father, help us to show the fruit of us being a Christian, whether it's with our finances or with how we handle our households, or Father, anything that we do out in the world, we need to show the light of Christ. And we need to show your fruit in our lives. Help us, Lord, be strong. Help us be courageous, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right, guys. The uh, two to five year olds uh, can follow Mrs. Towers and Mr. Mann uh, right out of here. Really appreciated the thoughts uh, around the table there. You know, it is a great kingdom that we're a part of. And the kingdom of heaven consists of those who dwell in heaven. You know, Ephesians chapter 2 talks about how we've been raised up and seated with Christ in heaven. The kingdom of heaven consists of those who dwell in the heavenly places, just like the kingdom of uh, you name the geographic, the kingdom of the United States dwe- uh, exists of those who dwell in the United States, and we're an empire, so don't give me any glares, Mr. Tuck. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, whatever kingdom it is, uh, that's, those residents dwell in that kingdom. Uh, it's a kingdom. If you look at Matthew 19, 23, and 24, you can see that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are the same. And if you look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, you can see that under the new covenant, the kingdom is here today. You exist in the kingdom, and the kingdom is with Christ in glory. The 6 to 11-year-olds can follow Adam out of here. Really appreciated Adam's stewardship this morning. Um, You know, God has a lot of grace and a lot of mercy for us. Um, But that scripture, you will know them by their fruits. It's it's, it's kind of talking about the gospel getting proclaimed. I really appreciated the man in the arena idea. Guys, I went to the Pro Football Hall of Fame yesterday. I had a buddy from out of town um, come in from Washington. And and one of the things that I kind of, the idea that I like is, you are what your record says you are. You are what your record says you are. The things that you spend time on, the things that you spend money on, the things that you spend energy on, those are the things that you really care about. And over a period of time, you are what your record says that you are. So if you don't like what your record says, go to practice. If you do like what your record says, keep doing and doing more the things uh, that you're doing. Mr. Harbor, come preach to us. Morning, church. Morning. It's really good to see everybody and to be seen. Uh, got a couple of uh, business uh, issues here. Uh, Trans Siberian uh, Orchestra Tribute Band, Siberian Solstice. Uh, the dates are on here. There's flyers on the uh, pulpit over there. And I wanted to make you aware, too, of the uh, uh, Survivor Day, November 17th. Um, a day for people who have uh, survived uh, loved ones, acquaintances, who have completed the act of suicide. Now, you can hear all over the media about the opioid crisis. And I, I have no doubt in counties like perhaps Lucas County and Cuyahoga County there is a crisis. But in the five county area in the past year, the uh, loss team have been called out on 23 suicides. The, the deaths in that same five county area by uh, opioids are minuscule uh, compared to the, the suicide deaths. So it is um, something we need to be aware of and to reach out to those folks. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 begins with consequently now nothing is condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who are not walking according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free away from the law of sin and death. For the law of being powerless, in that it was weak through the flesh, 
God, having sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and concerning sin, condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the ordinance of the law might be fulfilled in us. Those who are not walking according to the flesh, but walking according to the spirit. Those who are according to the flesh are mindful of the things of the flesh. Those who are according to the spirit are mindful of the things of the spirit. The mindset of the flesh, death. The mindset of the spirit is life and peace. Picking it up again in verse 12. Therefore, consequently, brother, we are debtors. Not to the flesh. Not to live according to the flesh, but for if you are living according to the flesh, you are about to die. But if you slay the practices of the body and the spirit, you'll be living. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship in which we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself is testifying together with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Indeed, heirs of God and heirs of Christ, if indeed we are suffering together with him, in order that we might also be glorified together with him. The indwelling Holy Spirit primary purpose in the Christian is not behavior modification. Let's pray. Great God in heaven, I am so grateful and thankful that there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Father, what freedom we have as your body, not, not to sin, not to be licentious, but Father, the freedom to serve you because of your divine presence, because of Jesus bearing it so that we might now reflect that glory. I pray that you would be with us today as we think about these things. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. We talk about the characteristics of the flesh. What does it mean to be in the spirit and not in the flesh. Well, of course you're in the flesh. I mean, if I pinch you and you say, ouch, because it hurts your flesh. So the characteristic of the flesh, basically the body, is neutral. Dr. Yuri Rogoff invited us to attend an autopsy one Saturday morning in Belarus. And there was a body that was being autopsy. Now, we were told a little bit of background, but this body, whether animated or not animated, was neutral. Now, that person's mind, same had 
driven that body to do some things that resulted in an early demise. But it wasn't because his flesh was irredeemable or there was some sort of, of uh, um, uh, Calvinistic idea of the fall so that flesh can't be redeemed. No, it was fueled by his mind, see? Romans 8, 5, for those who are according to the flesh are mindful of the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit are mindful of the Spirit. Tom brought that out really well this morning in the first hour. And this is not pleasant thoughts, okay? This isn't just, well, you know, think nice things. It's, it's a mindset that becomes the driver to our primary directive. Okay? Star Trek always you know, talked about what was their primary directive as they visited alien planets. Okay? Well, what is the Christian's primary directive? Certainly to seek and save the lost. Certainly that brings glory and honor to our Lord and Savior. But that has to be the motivating factor behind everything that we do. Everything that, that we decide. See, Romans uh, chapter 8 and verse 8 for those who are in the flesh are not able to please God now in a sense we're in the flesh because this is the, the earthly tent but our mindset is not say, well, what are we going to eat what are we going to drink what are, what are we going to um, take care of say. because the Christian say, Paul writes to, to the Christians in Rome but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God is dwelling in you. But if Christ is in you, Romans chapter 8 and verse 10, the body is indeed dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of Righteousness. And that means every bit of daily minutia comes underneath, see, the idea of carrying out our spiritual purpose. That cannot be achieved by man without divine assistance. What happens is then without divine assistance is you get you get a lot of nice people. But but you've got no momentum. See? Romans twelve one. Therefore, brethren, I'm encouraging you through the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, well-pleasing to God, which is your logical divine service. And not to fashion yourselves to this age, but be transfigured by the renewal of your mind that you may be proving in you what is the will of God, the good and acceptable and mature. The flesh is neutral, 
powered by the mind. The characteristics of those who are according to the flesh is simply this. I'm going to do what I want to do. Now, when you confront that attitude of I'm going to do what I want to do, then the next logical question that you need to ask is, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? I'm afraid that many in middle class Bible Belt evangelical circles propose that those who are according to the flesh are only the people in the gutter. Druggies and prostitutes and drunks and politicians. I think we need to be reminded that Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is writing a letter to the church at Rome. And in Romans chapter 1 and verse 7, he addresses it to all those who are in Rome, beloved of God, called holy ones. So holy ones still need to have the encouragement and the reminder that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Because apparently some of the beloved of God in Rome are confidently stumbling through life doing things their own way. I'm going to do what I want to do. And what's provided oftentimes is more uh, driven by market forces in the church than driven by the truth. Because people are looking to maybe not have that intimate relationship to disengage a little bit. They're looking for uh, biblical fig leaves or perhaps even proof texts to to cover their rebellious mindset, their fleshly desires. They, They seem to look for cover, and so that cover is provided then by uh, having a, an event say, that, that doesn't call for you to actively participate in, but simply uh, observe. But that, that's exactly what in Romans 6, 1, well then, what are we going to say? Are, are we remaining in sin so that, that grace may increase? Well, let it not happen. We who died to sin, how are we going to live in it any longer? Or, or are you ignorant that as many as were immersed into Christ Jesus were immersed into his death. Is it possible to, to 
2,000 years later, Twenty eighteen. That when the God of the Scripture gets in the way of the beloved of God, that the rebellious flesh can create a God of our own creation and imagination who is pleased with us. Yes, Virginia, idol worship is still a thing. <laughs> well, it may not be wood or stone. <clears throat> it's an ideology. Now, if you're willing to do that, the book of Hebrews has a, a warning for us. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29 says, how much worse punishment do you think will be deemed worthy of after having trampled underfoot the Son of God and having deemed the blood of the covenant which he made, which, which he was made holy, which he has made holy as common, having insulted the Spirit of grace. If you are living according to the flesh, no matter how well you have constructed your delusion, you will die. But if you put to death the deeds of the body in the spirit, you, you will live. So, characteristics of the flesh is I'm going to do what I want to do. Now, what's the characteristics of the spirit? Romans 8, 14. Uh, read these two verses out of order here. <laughs> For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Uh, verse 13, 8, 13. If you are living according to the flesh, you are about to die. But if you slay the practices of the body in spirit, you'll be living. Context. Marshall did a great lesson last week on Bible interpretation and how important it is to be able to articulate, see, the uh, scripture in the proper context, even though it may be referenced to proof text other principles when we're when we're going through the scriptures it's important to accurately describe what this portion is driving at now there is there is the temptation here to perhaps see a cause and effect of if you put to death the deeds of the body, then you will live see, as though it were uh, dependent upon putting to death the, uh, the deeds of the body. Now, the deeds of the body are going to be the result. See? It's not by the merit of you putting to death the deeds of the body that you will live. Life, as we have been created to live in communion with our Lord and our Creator, that life 
is the evidence. It's the fruit. See, that's why those. That's why the fruit of the spirit. See, not 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 multiplicity, but this is this is the evidence. This is what's produced as a result of, see, the spirit. Not produced as a result of. Okay, I'm going to straighten up and fly right for a while. Life in this context is not the result of clean living. I don't get me, I'm all for clean living. <laughs> I'm not going to devalue clean living, but there's a lot of people who are experiencing clean living without the Holy Spirit. Because, see, if clean living is the thing that gets us life, then it's about trying harder, see? And that just opens us up to a law-based mindset. The life that the scripture's talking about here doesn't have its origin in clean living, but out of context, it'd be easy to get that idea just from plucking this passage out as though it stood alone and trying to use the Bible as a recipe book Life is through the glory of the Father. Romans chapter 8 and verse 13. For if you are living according to the flesh, you are about to die. But if you slay the practices of the body in spirit, you will be living. There are many clean living people who are dying. Paul encounters some men from Ephesus in Acts 19.2. And he asked them, he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, well, we didn't even hear there was a Holy Spirit. Oh, <coughs> well, they were doing something. I mean, <coughs> I would like to believe that their mindset was, was set on piety. But they were trying to do what they knew. Romans 6 3. Or are you ignorant? That as many as were immersed into Christ were immersed into his death. Whose death? See, I get all concerned about putting myself to death when maybe my mindset would be better spent and more accurate if I realize that it is his death. I'm being immersed into his death in the name of. Verse 4, Therefore we were buried together with him through the immersion into his death. In order that, just as Christ was raised up from the dead, through the glory of the Father. we might also walk in the newness of life. Get that? Through the glory of the Father. For if we become united together with him in the likeness of his death, we will also be unified with him in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, do you think that a 
resurrected life and a clean life, that is not necessarily a resurrected life, would share some common externals. Well, sure. I mean, they're, they're kind of look the same to those who don't have spiritual eyes. But do you think they're the same? Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified together with him, in order that the body of sin might be done away, that we are to be enslaved to sin no longer. For he who has died has been made righteous away from sin. It's easy for life to kind of grind away at us, isn't it? I mean, we come in Lord's Day morning, we got good intentions, and things are going to be different this week. You know, life, life starts to grind. And then we start to kind of do the What are emergency measures to get through the week, instead of laying groundwork for the important things, see, of life through the Spirit, through the glory of God. Back to Romans 8 and 11. But if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus up from the dead is dwelling in you, he who raised the Christ up from the dead will also be giving life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who is dwelling in you. Romans 8, 8, those who are in the flesh are not able to please God. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God is dwelling in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. It is a big deal. It's a big deal. And those people, on the day of Pentecost, realized, when those Jews realized the position that they had put themselves in by crucifying the Christ, they asked Peter, what do we need to do? Peter said, repent and be immersed, each one of you, in the name of of the one who you put to death in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will be receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. What you put to death is far less important than what is resurrected to life. But until you are crucified with Christ, 
he can't occupy that territory. He demands our unconditional surrender. But then we have to continue that surrender to allow him to work through us. Being in this fleshly tent, being hardwired like we are, we look for cause and effect, yeah. evidence. Why did the guy shoot up the, the synagogue in Pittsburgh? <coughs> well, and all sorts of talking heads are going to talk about social reasons. Why is it that in the last week all these uh, letter bombs, see, what, what, what is his motivation? You know, I don't know and you don't know either. I mean, one thing that's obvious in both cases, they're, they're crazy. <laughs> But we look for reasons why things happen. And because we look for reasons why things happen, I think it's easy sometimes to fall into the idea that, well, if I'm a good boy or a good, a good girl, Jesus likes me better. See? Uh, put to death the deeds of the body, then you know, he's going he's gonna to give me life. And then I set out on that course as though it were up to me. Now, I'm not talking about, uh, please, don't, please don't hear me that, that I'm trying to say that, that anything goes. Uh, I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying that if, if we are really, see, dedicated to him and having our minds set on the spirit and, and not on the flesh, that becomes our prime director. That becomes our motivator. But it's so easy sometimes to slip back into that, that economy of, of the world see, that, that we work in that, that we forget see, that we are being transfigured by the renewal of our minds. Step by step, line upon line, precept upon precept. And that this engagement is not at our leisure. There's no war ever been fought at the leisure of the infantry. In Soviet times, the government decided to crack down on a growing problem of workers stealing tools and other things from the, the factories that they worked in. People were walking off with stuff. So they posted guards at the factory gates first night Yvonne clocks out and pushes a load of sawdust and wood scraps to the gate halt says Boris the guard who yesterday was working right beside Yvonne on the line 
Boris says, I need to search your wheelbarrow. I know you're hiding something under there. So they go over to the side. Yvonne empties his cart. Nothing but wood chips and sawdust. Next night, here comes Yvonne again, pushing his cart. Boris says, I need to see the bottom of that cart. So they go over, take the stuff out of the cart, take the wood chips, the sawdust, nothing's there. They put everything back in. That happens over and over and over until Friday, finally, every night, you know, they're spending, unload it, load it back up. Boris says, I know you, Yvonne. And I know that you are taking something from this plant. If you'll tell me what you're doing, what you're taking, it, it'll be our secret. And I promise that whatever this scheme is, uh, I, I won't tell anybody, but, but I need to know. What is it? And you're sneaking out of here. Yvonne steps closer, pulls out a flask of vodka, casts a glance around to be sure that nobody's listening, took a drink from his flask, passed it to Boris, and said, wheelbarrows. <laughs> You're going to find what you're looking for. And if you don't know to look for it, it's going to be easy to overlook it. If you think doing Bible things, Bible ways are only the outward appearance, then you don't know what you're looking for because the outward appearance is the evidence, not the exchange, the evidence see, of, of having that inner man. Therefore, if you were raised up with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Be mindful of the things which are above, not the things which are upon the earth. We have a purpose, a prime purpose directive that the glory of Jesus be seen through us that we seek and we save the lost we have the message the only message that will bring you see, society together, but the kingdom of God, the, the body of Christ, the church, is the, is the beta process. So we have to get this right in order to be salt and light in a city on a hill. And I am thankful that that mindset has, has found root and is, has gained uh, uh, traction in, in this local body. God has 
worked in the last uh, you know, 17 years through this local body, and I think the best is yet to come. There's a Latin term to use in law called habeas corpus, which basically means produce the body. Habeas corpus. Now, you can't produce it, but we can certainly exemplify it, can't we? Let's stand. Let's sing number 538. Number 538, first and last verse. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with his trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Oh, in Christ the solid rock I stand, all the ground is sinking sand, all the ground is sinking sand. All right, um, don't forget tonight at 6.30, uh, doing a presentation on Pennsylvania Family Camp. Uh, bring something to share. If you didn't get a chance to sign up for uh, the meal on Thursday night, there's a sign-up sheet up here. Don't forget to pick up some of those flyers. Um, put them where uh, people will notice them. Hand them out to your friends. Mail them. Um, anything else I should announce? Any birthdays? I know we sang Mike Thursday night, but we, you know this is this is kind of different on Sunday morning, so you'll be even more embarrassed. So we'll sing to you again. Any other birthdays or anniversaries? All right, let's sing Happy Birthday to Mike. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Mike. Happy birthday to you. We wish you a happy birthday. We wish you a happy birthday. We wish you a happy birthday and a happy birthday. Okay, anything else we should announce? Yeah, whoop, somebody needs to pray here, don't they? So, I, don't, I, I have to be retrained. Brian! Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, and thank you for the lessons we had this morning, Lord, and thank you for everybody here, Lord. We just pray that you be with those on the list and those who can make it, and Lord, we just pray that you will use us to be your light to others in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, this, this was only the three-minute period between rounds, so now we're going we're gonna to go start that, uh, start that fight back up again. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, one... Two, three, let's get ready to rumble!